So the paper I'm presenting uh, today is a joint paper uh, with uh, Professor Elkin Cohen. Um, it was recently accepted for publication, but uh, we very much welcome a lot of comments, especially from constitutional law scholars, but from all of you, uh, we would love to hear uh, your thoughts about it. Um, the big question that we ask in this paper is how can we oversee content moderation by AI? This is the big question. Now, to connect it to the um, focus of this uh, session, which is, which is platform liability, it looks like it, f it would fit better in the previous session that was about content uh, moderation, but it is connected, of course, to platform liability. And the connection is this. Um, we recently see how platforms are under increased pressure to moderate online content and to hoon their gatekeeping function um, and prevent the spread of um, harmful content. So we see it in different areas. Um, Autumn, wherever he, Autumn talked, mentioned some of them earlier. Um, hate speech with uh, Germany's uh, recent legislation. Uh, we have terrorist propaganda with the European Commission's uh, recent uh, proposal to remove content within one hour. Uh, we see it in regarding to fake news, um, copyright, of course. I'm, I am an IP scholar, so this is like my uh, uh, favorite example uh, with the recent uh, copyright directive holding platforms uh, possibly liable for content, uh, for infringing content posted by um, their users. So um, in the US, of course, things are of course, very much different, dif different. In terms of platform liability, we have, of course, a Section 230, which the, with the broad immunity it provides to platforms. Um, however, platforms could be found liable for um, their own illegal content. Uh, we saw it recently in the Amazon case, um, holding that Amazon could be the seller of a defective dog color, collar, okay, as being a seller, not only a platform, but also um, a seller. And also, um, if a platform uh, perform, and this is a case law um, wording that uh, is read here in the bottom, if platform perform public, public functions that were traditionally executed exclusively by the government, then it could be held to a higher standard of uh, scrutiny, of constitutional scrutiny, if it performs something that is a public uh, function. Now, um, our uh, argument in this, one of the arguments in the paper is that um, content moderation for the purpose of law enforcement, okay, for the purpose of law enforcement, Enforcement is actually a public uh, function. It's something law enforcer were, were usually public official, traditionally exclusively public officials. So uh, when pa platform engages in, in uh, law enforcement, it uh, effectually acts as a public, sort of a public um, actor, and then it should be subjected to notions of oversight, legitimacy, accountability. Um, we want to ensure they protect um, individual liberties, we want to safeguard against abuse of power, and, and th the big idea is that we want to ensure that they secure our social content when they enforce our law, when they get the job to be law enforcers, so let me see that you follow the rule of law and that you actually um, secure the social contract. However, of course, platforms are private. We know that platforms are private entities. Uh, we don't want to interfere with their business discretion. We don't want to interfere with um, their editorial uh, role. Uh, of course, in the US, uh, such interference would amount to violation of their First Amendment rights. Platform has its own First Amendment right to decide for itself. So um, when, we're looking about, uh, when we look at content moderation by AI, we can map different, uh, uh, we found three functions, you can think about maybe additional ones, but three major functions that platforms do when they uh, moderate content, sorry, by using um, AI. So first of all, we have the content matching. They match users and content. They want to maximize the time we spend on the platform. This is their business model. They collect more data, so they want to match the best data uh, that meets our preferences. This is definitely a private function. Nobody would say uh, otherwise here, I guess. This is something that is very private. It's their business model. 
Then they uh, deal with content adjudication, which is um, adjudicating conflicting claims uh, regarding the legitimate use of content. So uh, I said I'm an IP scholar, so it's easier for me to use examples from IP law. So think about content ID, for instance, which is the technology, uh, the technology uh, YouTube uses to match between right holders and users of their content. The, it, ident it identifies a match. Okay, this video contains copyrighted content. There is a match, and now the right holder can decide to monetize the use. It's like a, um, a, mix, uh, a, a mix matching, uh, uh, exactly, um, uh, function. This is a bit, a bit more trickier to classify as public of, or private. I think it's more private still, but we can argue, argue about it. Um, but what is the most, not the most important, but what is, the argument here is that when the platform engages in law enforcement, that is, when it removes content because the content is illegal, this is law enforcement. If, if you remove infringing content because it is infringing under copyright law, this is a public uh, function. So um, ideally, we would like to see two buildings, and in one we see the public functions, and in the other the private, what, whatever you fit, uh, in each building. We can argue just about that, what is public and what is private, but let's say we agree that uh, law enforcement is public. Um, we would like to see uh, public oversight only on the public function and leave the private for the platform. So this is a good ideal, but the problem, and this is the main um, insight of the project of the paper, is that with, with content moderation by AI, these different functions, the private and the public, are all integrated together in a single complicated system of AI. They are all mixed together, integrated in a way that you cannot easily or at all separate between them. And this is a huge challenge. It's not like you can really build two buildings. It's, they are all um, integrated together. And um, the risk is that private considerations will affect public ones and vice versa. So. Uh, the thing is, from a technological point of view, you have um, a system that runs on the same data. So things that are that affect the the, the private optimization, and I'm not I'm not going to get into the uh, technological um, design. I have one uh, slide on it. If we have time later, we can talk about it. But just to, to to understand the big the big thing. The private affects the public. I will demonstrate it with, again, copyright, because this is easier um, for me. Um, so let, lo let's look, for instance, on how YouTube uh, manages the use of um, videos, the, the content moderation by YouTube. So of course, she ha uh, YouTube has the recommendation algorithm that matches videos to users. Okay, This is the private thing. Then there is content ID that I mentioned earlier. This is, I think, private, but still we can argue, never mind. And then we have the specific instances where Content ID flags a video as containing copyrighted content, and then the right, holders the right holder decides to remove the content. This is uh, unauthorized use of my content, remove it. At this point, that you remove content because it is infringing under the law, this is a public function, okay? However, as I said, all of them are combined together and affect one another. So, for instance, um, we can look at how the private affects the public. So, if YouTube has data about the viewing grade of specific copyrighted content, let's say owned by Disney, there are a lot of views of content whenever this content includes a, uh, con uh, copyrighted content by um, Disney. So this data could affect how, you, how co content ID is defined. Now it could change the threshold of content ID. So content ID would be triggered more easily, even when a user makes a de minimis use of Disney content, or even when a user makes a fair use of Disney content, just because YouTube knows she, in, the, in the private uh, site she will earn more from it. And then it could be on the other side, video that is cleared, that is it contains no copyrighted content, it's just um, regular content with nothing uh, protected in it, this could affect 
the private, deter the private determination of content matching. So perhaps YouTube gonna match it less to user because it's less profitable. There's nothing, there's no copyright in it, so I earn less from it. So I prefer to recommend other content to users. So we have here um, kind of a, a complicated uh, system that um, is integrated with different, um, different considerations that some are private and some of are public. Um, just to, to, to name a short, an, another example that is not about copyright, think about border -like, borderline content. There are evidence that Facebook or YouTube, they earn more from borderline content, from content that is very uh, extreme. Extremist content is more profitable, but it's less legal. So it's like you see both um, consideration working at the same time, and it's hard to separate them. So given um, this uh, complicated system of AI where private functions and public functions merge together in an inseparable uh, way, what still can be done to uh, facilitate oversight? Coming back to the beginning to the uh, main question. So um, the solution we propose is a solution in the design of the system. And what we say is actually, um, Pretty and not so complicated, it, it is quite simple. And we say that um, the separation between these public functions, sorry, and private pu functions should be in the design of the system. That is, um, we're thinking about, let's say, installing an external app, okay? Let's go back to copyright. We have YouTube and we have Content ID. YouTube continues to use its recommendation algorithm to match content and users, okay? Co um, content ID keeps working to facilitate transactions between, uh, to monetize uh, copyrighted content. But to the extent that a right, holders, a right holder says, I want to remove the content. It, you, you use my content? I don't, I don't, I don't want to monetize it. Remove it. The decision about removal, again, a public decision, would be made by this external app. External app that was developed outside of Facebook, outside of YouTube. That is, it's sort of a private platform, public tools. You, we're going to outsource the decision making about the public issues, about the removal of content for illegality. Other things we're gonna re are going to remain the platform's sole, in, in the platform's sole discretion. But the moment we want to remove the something because it's illegal, this would be outsourced to an external tool. And this external tool were, will, will um, embed legal principles and uh, case law and public values. Of course, depends on, on the jurisdiction. Um, so uh, this is the, 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 the idea. It has its benefits, of course, and of course, a lot of costs as well. We try to address them. Uh, we can talk maybe more, I think, uh, not, I'm running out of time, but we can have two minutes. Okay, so um, the benefits are, of course, first increasing the oversight, at least taking what we, what we can agree that is public. And for this, we want um, somebody else to decide, which is not, again, it's not a human being, it's going to be a technology, but this technology is not owned by the platform itself. It's the, then we are stuck with the who guards the guardian question. We want some, uh, something external that embeds our values, and it's, again, it's AI, so it's dynamic. We can change it over time to adjust it, adjust it according to case law and whatever. Um, also, it could encourage competition and innovation. Think that now we have YouTube, and YouTube has content ID, and it's amazing. And it invested a lot of money in developing it, but not all platforms can do the same and can invest in s this sort of amounts of money, and um, they don't have the, 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 the data to do it. Now, if we're going to allow this outsourcing, we might see more competition and more innovation. Of course, why should YouTube? allow this. Somebody else is going to work on my data and develop an external tool. Of course, we will need a reg regulatory intervention. We will have to see a, a regulator saying, YouTube, you have to do it. Okay? Otherwise, she's not going to voluntarily allow an external app to be built on its platform and make decisions for it. Okay? Of course, it has to be some sort of legal uh, intervention here. Um, questions of da data ownership also uh, 
are important, we have to address them to see um, how uh, to deal with that. And another thing um, is the issue of efficiency, because there is advantage at, at, in the way the system works now that the algorithm, the AI system, see the whole picture. Okay, you don't only see if it's infringing or not infringing, but you see the context, you see the, the, the users, you see, um, you see more. Okay, and here you see, you, you see less because you, we want you to, be, to remain objective. So it's a matter of cost and benefits, but we, we still think that to, to solve the problem or at least to begin solving the problem of overseeing content moderation by AI, the solution has to be in the design has to be in the design of the, the system. Here uh, I will end and uh, whoever, uh, I would love to hear questions, thoughts, comments, and. Uh. So I guess that uh, we have like um, six minutes, something like that. So if anyone has uh, something, comment, yes. Uh, thank you, it was really interesting. I'm not sure that you can really distinguish so clearly, also in the theoretical level, not just the practical level, between the functions. I think that the content matching could be uh, labeled as public as well as the content removal. From, from certain perspective, for example, <coughs> from, from, from the, the perspective of the, the uh, freedom of expression of the user, it doesn't have a lot of, of different if my content removed or my content, nobody can see my content because of, of the decision uh, out there. And also if we look not on, on individual rights, but rather on public interest, so right. question of social order, question of, of the, the public value of the freedom of expression of all of us, not just individual users. So in this case, question, of content matching uh, has a lot of public importance. It's like, like fake, fake news, filter bubble, all these issues that are not come, are not, the reason for them is not coming from the content removal, but rather from the content matching. So I think the content matching is also public. So, so. Thank you, it's, it's a great comment. And sure, if you look from the perspective of the user, you would say, of course, whatever influence my free speech or my access to information or the free, free flow of information is a public interest. But, but I think that um, such an argument would be very, very hard to, uh, to use in order to, con especially in the US, where, you, where they are reluctant to see, they don't want to see any intervention, they don't for oversight it almost at all. Uh, and trying to say that um, th they barely s see a platform as public in any instance whatsoever. So to, to use their core business model, uh, uh, matching matching users and content, again, to the extent that it's legal, okay? Fake news, you can come and you can at least theoretically say, no, this is illegal content. So matching between, um, matching fake news to users, this is, Okay, it's, it's uh, matching content, so it's kind of a private function, but it's regarding illegal content. So this is something that is still yeah. public. To the extent that the content you match is legal, I think that matching the content is the, 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 the core business to, to, to ask for intervention over there, it would be very, very, very drastic and very controversial than to say, okay, when, when you act as law enforcers, Enforcer, this is where you obey to our rules, to, to the rules of the jurisdiction. So here, I think the platform itself would, would love to see less response. Somebody else is checking what you, whenever you remove hate speech and you, you don't have the sole responsibility to do it by yourself, um, in, in a position to find a matching or This is your model. You want to collect more, more data as long as you do it on legal content. But I definitely agree with the comment that it depends what size you look at it from <coughs> the platform or from the user. All right. Yeah. Thank you uh, for this wonderful presentation. A small comment. At one point, you had mentioned um, that the, the uh, AI would be adjusted as needed in order to uh, move forward and respond to its needs. One feature of AI that I find particularly interesting and disturbing especially for, for us jurists, is uh, its unpredictability and that it may involve evolving ways that we haven't 
education may be somewhat out of our control, no matter yeah. what we put in yeah. to their education. Um, so I'm wondering, and, and I don't know if there's actually a, a, an answer that probably isn't, but just in terms of, of, of the thinking process, yeah. um, what, if anything, can be thought about uh, for palliating the unpredictability of the AI ah. in this case? I have no clue. Like, I, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know. We, but it's something we, we, we need to, to think about. Um, and I think that, um, of course, a, a, AI, it's all about learning and improving or not improving, depends how you look at it, but the changing and being dynamic. But at least when when you know that the system learns from, from case law, from, uh, from laws, from values, uh, it's different than learning from like the whole range of, de of data that you have over there that influence one, one another. At least when you know that the, 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 the raw, raw data is at least um, fair to this jurisdiction or reasonable or maybe a, a little bit mitigating the, the, this risk, but yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the um, difference that you see between legal and illegal content. Because you've mentioned, for example, fake news. Fake news is not illegal. It's not illegal. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think um, what exactly is going to be the benefit of the of the system that you um, uh, that you suggest. Because if it's totally illegal, then local co courts can actually um, fulfill this job, right. or, if, or, or at least the, um, uh, the platforms are going to obey uh, uh, local legislation, just as Facebook, for example, announced last uh, week about the Singaporean law, right. uh, which you haven't uh, mentioned. Um, so I'm trying right. to figure out how exactly this model is dealing with the core issue of the semi-illegal um, uh, content, for example, um, uh, fake news. And also, you, you've mentioned the, um, the AI system. If I'm trying to think um, about Israeli legislation that deals with illegal content, for example, uh, harassment or something like that, look at the, um, at the court decisions. The, the, the judges themselves can decide what is legal and what right. is it. There is no predictability at all, even with, with current um, uh, legislation and, its, uh, and, and the surrounding decisions, uh, court decisions. Right. So that's why I, I was wondering yeah. if you can. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's an excellent question, and um, I'll do my best to, to, to answer, but um, uh, it, it's a tough one, especially when you're trying to take, and I, I tried, we do it less in the paper itself, but I did try to do it in this presentation, to do it more here because of, of the diversity here of the participants. It's not just US audience, it's more uh, diverse from Europe and all. I think in, in Europe it would be easier because there is now more and more legislation um, that that requires the, the, the platform to do things, um, which is um, and, and these are the, e, the this is this gonna hate speech gonna be illegal or terrorist propaganda is illegal in the U.S. Is, it's much harder. I, I use the example of copyright law because this is a un, uh, not only because I'm an IP scholar because this is a very unique um, <coughs> example and an easy one where you do have a r r regulation of the platform. You need if you, a, a part, a partial regulation at least. If you want to enjoy enjoy, enjoy immunity, you have to remove copyright infringement. So if you remove content and you say it's because it infringes copyright. I want to make sure. I want to make sure that this is exactly because because of this. Because you you, you comply with the rule of law. Because uh, you comply with the legal definitions of substantial simila similarity of fair use of all what what, what we not know in copyright law. Um, yes, but, but but wherever you don't have this. Um, Set a law about saying what is legal and what is not. It's 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 much harder. You can translate it to the um, terms of use of the, the platform. Like the platform says in its own terms of use that we won't allow fake misinformation or we won't allow and maybe try to um, apply it there. But it's going to be very harder to ar to argue that this is public. It's going to still be private. I think. And 
First, I wanna just a minute. Okay. Okay. So first, I wanna thank the organizers for putting together this really um, great conference, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk about sharing economy platforms that I call access platforms, and I'm gonna argue that we should conceptualize uh, access platforms as what I call market constituting fiduciaries. Now, I'm a property law person, and my interest in access platforms comes from my work on property law in the sharing slash access um, economy, which is also the topic of my new book, as Mayan mentioned. Now, in the book, I think about property-related access platforms, like Airbnb and Turo, which is a peer-to-peer -peer car rental, um, and the property implications of choosing access over ownership. But in this particular project, I cast a wider net and uh, think about access platforms more generally and um, also consider platforms that are service-oriented like Uber. <laughs> so the paper is about peer-to-peer -peer <laughs> platforms like Airbnb, Uber, TaskRabbit, EatWith, and Turo, and many others. And I call peer-to-peer -peer platforms access platforms because they facilitate access to goods, access over ownership, and access to services. And the question that I'm tackling is, what is the role of access platforms in private law jurisprudence? So I'm looking for a legal conceptualization, not simply legal implications, right? We can go ahead and talk about um, regulation, but first we need to know what it is, is it that they do, uh, in what capacity, uh, what is the legal basis? For example, some scholars argue that Airbnb should be held responsible for the discrimination practiced by their users. Um, and I actually agree, but first, again, we need to ask um, why, what is their legal role as a legal actors, and I think the answers will guide regulation, not the other way around. And so my main argument is that access platforms create and maintain a unique market. They um, control and enforce the infrastructure for activity, the code of acceptable behavior, and the rules of participation. And I'm turning to fiduciary law in conceptualizing this role. Now, this is not a typical type of fiduciary relations, and we can talk about it more maybe in the comments, but it is a fiduciary type that targets the duties of a legal actor that constitutes a market. And I call this concept market constituting fiduciary. Um, so let me talk a little bit about access platforms. Access platforms connect owners and users, service providers and service recipients, and facilitate the rental of goods and services. So if I need a car, I can rent a car from somebody who lives in my neighborhood through Turo, and if I'm a tourist, I can uh, rent a room in somebody's home through Airbnb. Now, these, these are often real offline transactions taking place, and they require some level of coordination and cooperation, and sometimes even face-to-face -face interactions. And I think these platforms are different from other online information platforms like Facebook and Google, right? Um, Facebook and Google concern content, concern content management and, in, and user information, not these offline um, short-term rental transactions. So many scholars group these two categories together, and um, although there are similarities, I think they present different dilemma, or at least there's a, an additional dilemma, and grouping them together misses the sort of the, the fact that access platforms create a unique market. So access platforms not only facilitate and mediate transactions, they can withhold entry and force exit from uh, their activities, so they control participation for their terms of service. Access platform determine the mechanism from, for closing a deal and the terms that the parties can and cannot negotiate. Um, they nudge the user into a desired level of activity and frequency of use. Access platforms also create the uh, mechanism uh, for, evaluate, for evaluating the transactions through their system of reviews. Uh, platforms affect the style and marketing of products and services in the market. Uh, Airbnb hosts, for example, uh, Airbnb influences hosts' behavior in, uh, in their home, the home style and the core, 
and um, the interaction with guests. So platforms impact and nudge the, the, the level of intimacy and privacy in, in property use. So based on all these traits, we can think of several models for conceptualizing the legal role of access platforms. Um, one model would be the public utilities approach. Right? So online platforms provide an essential service and should be regulated as a semi-public entity. Um, now I think the problem is, so this model may apply to Facebook and Google, but the problem is that access platforms um, don't really offer essential, an essential service, right? There are market alternatives, and in some cases these are just luxury services. Now a second mo model is um, Jack Balkin's information fiduciary model. Now the main problem for Balkin is surveillance and um, the use of personal information. And the problem may be evident, evident in certain access platforms, uh, but um, I think that this conceptualization does not engage enough with the market-like attribute of access platforms. And then another uh, possible model is employers, right? Maybe, um, maybe they're just employers, and I think that Uber, at least, is, is gradually understood as an employer, at least in certain jurisdictions. Now, the problem is this conceptualization can only apply to service-oriented platforms, not to property-oriented platforms like Turo. And also, it only targets the service provider, right, the driver, not the service recipients. It can be uh, passengers, tourists, visitors, right? So it doesn't capture the full role of access platforms. And then a third model would be brokers. So Airbnb is just a real estate broker. And I think that you know, this conceptualization does not account for uh, many of the functions and powers of access platforms. OK, so what I'm suggesting is um, uh, that we um, think about them as market constituting fiduciaries and think about what are the duties of an actor who constitutes a market in private law. Now, according to the argument, access platforms perform two functions here. So one is a service performing function and the other is the market constituting uh, function. So the service performing, performing uh, function is that platforms give advice, uh, they consult, they broker, and in this sense they are the new professionals. But more importantly, they constitute a market, they create a unique marketplace. And unlike eBay or Amazon where people sell goods, uh, we are talking about a market for short-term um, use of goods that are still owned by the owner or services that are provided by the service provider and there's, as I said, some level of interaction between the parties, or continued interactions. And also this is a market that facilitates transactions on a much larger scale than previous transactions have taken place in the past b before the mediation of a platform. So platform constitute a market and control it through various means. Um, through uh, uh, rules that are dictated in the terms of service, through uh, recommendation and suggestions in their blogs, and through nudging. Um, so platforms control participation, entry and exit, the mechanism for closing a deal, its evaluation, its results, and the level and scope of participation by users. So we can say that access platforms exercise discretionary role, uh, discretionary control over the interests of market participants. And this is a key feature of fiduciary relations. And I argue that, that uh, this role creates a duty of loyalty towards participants, owners and users, service providers and service recipients in their shared interest as market participants. Um, now the main implication of this uh, duty of loyalty is that they have to respect the interests um, of participants in a fair, open, and stable market. Right? So unlike the information fiduciary by Balkin, who some people take to sort of block public regulation, the point is not to negate public regulation, but rather just think about what is their role, what, is the, what are the duties of access platforms towards participants in, in private law. And there are three concrete implications of this duty of loyalty, as I see it. One is the duty to mitigate discrimination. The second is the duty to give prior notice before pulling out of an area of activity. And the third is the duty to create fair entry and exit rules. So let's talk about discrimination. There are numerous reports of racial and gender <coughs> discrimination in collaborative consumption enterprises. Right? So do access platforms have a responsibility to mitigate discrimination practiced by their users? 
And some scholars argue that there is such an obligation, and I think that the market constituting fiduciary concepts explains why. And although, although the, the platform itself may not discriminate, its control over various elements of the market, including its structure and design, users, users' behavior in a market, um, um, establishes a responsibility towards market participants to create a market that is um, open to different backgrounds. So this duty uh, ensures that users, both active and potential users, are able to freely participate in the market. And, and platforms, because they control the design and structure, can do it by uh, controlling various elements of the design. Now, the second implication is ensure a minimal level of stability. And I argue for a duty to give prior notice. So people who choose this market depend on its continued existence. Right, so um, um, I may decide not to buy a car, but rather to rent a car. Um, some people depend on it for their livelihood. And if a platform pulls out of an area abruptly, then the user has no time to prepare. So in Austin, Texas, for example, Uber and Lyft pulled out within a couple of days after uh, strict regulation was passed in 2015. <coughs> now, other companies quickly stepped in in that particular case, but let's assume that they didn't. And I argue there's a duty to allow minimal stability, uh, which requires prior notice. And then the third implication is fair entry and exit rules. So in addition to minimal stability of the market, we have to ensure minimal individual and group stability. So a platform cannot arbitrarily ban entry or forced exit uh, of particular users or groups. And the duty includes some transparency in the decision-making process. Uh, um, and so if a platform decides to force um, a user out of, of its activity, it has to conduct a fair process, one that allows the user to be heard. Now we can add more specific duties and also debate over the particulars of the arrangement. But what's most important uh, for me is that we think about what it means in private law to constitute a market in a world where new markets are forming and what obligation this role uh, creates toward market participants. Um, but um, some of them 
or not. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that's have minimal fees. I'm not talking about vocational training. I'm only um, thinking about what it means to constitute a market. And in this sense, there are some of the duties that look a little bit like private public law. Some of the duties look a little bit like um, uh, the duties of an employer. But um, they're all rooted in the concept of having uh, uh, having the, the fiduciary role of creating a market and controlling most of its features. So my question is, if, if, if they're really creating a market, mm -hmm. or is it just you know the move of what happened in the labor market in the past, for example, in other car provision services like taxis, mm -hmm. into a platform? So in what way do they create a market that is different from what happened in the labor market with, when those platforms did not exist? And I disagree that labor law does not consider customers. Uh, okay, but it's a lot of my work. But, um, and, but it might be that they shape differently the relationship, right? Um, okay. right. So we can imagine here a sort of um, a continuum where Uber is on one end of the spectrum, uh, where Uber is very much involved in um, the activities <coughs> of, the, of its drivers. And in this sense, I do agree with the conceptualizations that see Uber as an employer. But you have other examples. Uh, you have EatWiz, you have TaskRabbit, and you have um, uh, other other forms. You have peer-to-peer -peer platforms like Blabla and Car, where people you know uh, carpool together. And so, and you have so you have various levels of control. And I don't think we can see all of them as the uh, Uber example of <coughs> actually being an employee. I get a question regarding the the a priori, a priori noticing because. In my opinion, this would be hard to do because in the case I know, this is the Austrian case, mm -hmm. um, there was an administrative court, administrative court in Vienna um, and they decided that Uber had um, to pull out of the market. You know? So it, it, your Austrian example seems to be similar to that. So actually the regulation was not like the solution but more of a problem because Uber and Lyft just pulled out because they were there, there were some regulations in, in the Austrian case where there were some taxi regulations mm -hmm. that were pretty outdated, uh, mm -hmm. by the way. Actually, so it seems to be too hard to do, and they, they even had like a, a pre preliminary measures, so they had, to, they had to pull out of the market in, in 24 hours, mm -hmm. otherwise it, it would be a breach of these measures mm -hmm. and could lead to uh, liability and, uh, and also administrative fees. So. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so I mean, in Austin as well, there was, there was a, a regulation that Uber and Lyft did not want to meet. And so they pulled out of the area abruptly. I think that part of what they can do is give some sort of prior notice. I mean, regulations are not happening overnight, in that sense. Um, um, and you can, um, you can give a prior notice uh, beforehand in a way that allows the, allows the user to prepare. And maybe what the regulation has to consider as well is allowing time for certain platforms to give this prior notice. Um, um, but I think that we have to realize that um, when users are dependent on the market, and especially if you think about um, property related platforms, if I decide not to buy a car and I rely on a certain platform to allow me to do that, and then abruptly I'm in a condition where I have no other alternative, I think that destabilizes the market. According to your um, model, are all access platforms um, created equally? Uh, should they be uh, subject uh, to the same treatment? Because you mentioned very famous platforms like Airbnb, but possibly there are smaller access platforms that do not have a, a sizable market share. So would you make a distinction here? So, And secondly, just an observation, I think it's really curious um, that uh, the concept of fiduciary, like one of the oldest common law concepts, mm -hmm. uh, is gaining this new significance mm -hmm. in the digital age. So you mentioned Dolphin's information fiduciary is a new, you suggest fiduciary duties, and uh, I used it in my work and not on AI. And well, there seems to be something about this concept that captures, um, I don't know, our expectations of uh, you know, honorable behavior, fair behavior, something very fundamental. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you, really interesting. So in terms of are they equal, so I wouldn't look at the market share. Uh, I would look perhaps on um, the level of involvement, involvement that the platform has in, in users' behavior and in, uh, in sort of the level.
level um, of, of crafting the market and its rules. Um, and that would be, for me, um, a way to sort of, as I said before, put them on a sort of a continuum, and perhaps the duties uh, uh, will change based on how much of the market do they could constitute and how much, uh, uh, how much they allow users to sort of freely, um, freely uh, um, reach their own terms uh, in the transaction. Um, and in terms of, of thinking about fiduciary law more broadly, I really, I, 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 do have, I wrote this particular paper for a symposium on, uh, on transnational fiduciary law. So my book only deals with property platforms. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that fiduciary law is, because I think it's an area of private law most interested in power, and so we, if we want to look within private law and not uh, say, well, let's do profit regulation uh, uh, immediately, then fiduciary law does a lot of work. And um, <coughs> it's been expanded. Uh, actually, people are now saying that the state is a fiduciary, the city is a fiduciary. So it sort of goes back to try to public law and makes it full circle. Thank you very much, Shelley. <laughs> So, hello from me. Um, thanks for having me. Just a few, uh, short personal note at the beginning. It's an honor to be here, especially because actually after finishing my studies, my master's, I went to Tel Aviv to work there and I stayed in an Airbnb and things, <laughs> things went wrong. And then eventually I decided to go back to Austria and write a dissertation on Airbnb. That's a true story, actually. So, so as a, I'm sure, most of you will be with familiar with Airbnb to a certain extent. I won't describe the platform. Um, just one thing, Airbnb has established uh, in the last years. Initially, it was just focused on short-term rentals. In the meantime, in a, in, in, in the meantime it also has, um, you can find activities, um, experiences or restaurant reviews on the platform. But I will focus on a core activity that is still the short-term rentals. The specific issue I will speak about is the liability for bad performance or non-performance of the host. Airbnb's stance on that is pretty clear. It states in its terms that it is not a party or participant in any contractual relationship between members and does not guarantee the existence, quality, safety, suitability or legality of any member content. It claims to be liable solely for intent and gross negligence of itself and its agent or employees or in case of culpable death of personal injuries. That is actually textbook European consumer protection law because the unfair terms directive prohibits these exact disclaimers so for culpable death and so on. So let us assume that some European states might not be happy with this stance and might want to establish liability for the non-performance or bad performance of the host in certain cases. And this might not be an unreason unreasonable thing to do just given the fact that there is a homepage with the not very subtle name airbnbhell.com that is overflowing with reports of apartments being cancelled last minute, being rented to two people at the same time or not even existing at all. So how could they do that? This could be made in different ways. For example, states could set up rules for cases in which a platform generates the impression that it is responsible for the fulfillment of the obligation of the host made by ways of shifting a burden. This is, for example, what a discussion draft of European scholars suggested as early as 2016. Furthermore, states could also have the interest to establish certain monitoring duties and make platforms liable if they are breached by them. But would that be in line with European law? Let's take a look at the freedom to provide services as one of the fundamental freedoms of the European Union. For providers of information society services, it is concretized in the Electronic Commerce Directive. So the first crucial question is if Airbnb is an information society service in the sense of the directive, which, by the way, is one of the questions the Court of Justice of the European Union has to deal with right now in the ongoing procedure by the name of Airbnb Ireland. If that would be the case, member states could not just restrict the freedom to provide the services at will, but there are both substantive and procedural criteria that have to be fulfilled. So the definition of an information society service already exists in European law from a 1998 directive on specific technical standards. It is a service normally provided for remuneration at a distance by electronic means and at the individual request of a recipient of services. Two criteria do not need to be discussed any further. 
The remuneration is clear. Airbnb is not just normally, but in every case, the recipient of remuneration, this is their business model. Also, the individual request is a given. But what is, um, but is the service provided at the distance by and by electronic means? I mean, there is no physical meeting between Airbnb or, an uh, or a representative or employee of Airbnb and neither host nor guest, which could be interpreted that Airbnb provides a service at the distance. Also, the contract between Airbnb and the users is established during means of the internet. But to the service as a whole, there is a non-electronic element as well as an element of physical proximity. So, one could say Airbnb is a mixed service, including elements of an electronic service and non-electronic elements as well. The first question is CJEU, the Court of Justice of the European Union, asks in such cases if the two components are separable of, from each other. If yes, each can be treated due to the applicable legal regime. But what is the case if it is not separable? <coughs> the CJEU had to deal with this question firstly in the case of Elite Tax in the year 2017, in a proceeding regarding the service of Uber. The court argued that while a priori the directive would be applicable, due to two criteria it is not to be seen. Uber, in, a, in this case, is not to be seen as information service provider, but as an overall service whose main component is a transport service. First, what I would call the market maker criterion, the platform, the drivers would not offer the services and the passengers would not use the services provided by those drivers without the existence of Uber. And second, the provider has decisive influence on the conditions under which the material services are provided by the drivers. In the case of Uber, this was a maximum fare. The company receives the payment before passing it on to the drivers and it exercises a certain control over the quality of cars, the drivers and their conduct, which can eventually lead to their exclusion of the platform. So what about that? I don't think the first criterion is particularly helpful. I mean, the offer of Uber certainly creates some kind of supply, as does the service of Airbnb probably, but it is hardly a clear-cut decision. There have been short-term rentals before, there has been inner-city transport before, I think the platforms have changed the market, definitely reorganized it maybe, but this is kind of a weak criterion in my opinion. And furthermore, it is one of the explicit aims of the electronic commerce directive to stimulate investment in innovation and not to impede an innovation. So um, the market maker criterion would kind of counteract the in intentions of the e-commerce directive. You say if it's innovative, if it creates a new market, then the directive is not applicable at all. So basically the decisive argument, in my opinion, should be the control argument. The control of the provider of the information society service over the material service. This is also what um, Air Advocate General Spooner in the case of Airbnb argues. Concerning Airbnb, Spooner states that Airbnb does not exercise control of the economically significant aspects, such, a, such as location and standard of the accommodations. The price of the rentals is in his, in his point of view not that important to the short-term rental market. He goes on arguing that while Airbnb offers some assistance to hosts, finally it is the hosts itself that decide if and how they create their offer. Furthermore, like Uber, also Airbnb can suspend its users, but primarily due to breaches of the contract with Airbnb itself or due to the self-proclaimed standards of the users and not, as in the case of Uber, the standards that Uber itself has de had determined. The payments that a subsidiary of Airbnb collects as a fiduciary is not enough in this opinion. Other services, such as insurance services that Airbnb provides for hosts, are not inseparable, therefore, in line with the judicial, li uh, with the judicial tradition since the Kerr Optica case, different services and are not uh, interesting in this case. While disagreeing with Advocate General Spooner on the importance of the price control, I definitely think that price is uh, very important to the short-term rental market, as indeed as Airbnb indeed does not fix prices or establish upper caps such as Uber does, I agree on the result of uh, his opinion. As an interim result, I therefore have to conclude that Airbnb is in its core an information society service provider. So what now? Second question is, is Airbnb even more? Is Airbnb a hosting provider in the sense of directive? This is an 
information society service that <coughs> consists of the storage of information provided be by a recipient of the services. If this is the case, if this would be the case, the platform could not be made liable for the information stored at the request of a recipient of the service unless, unless he has actual knowledge of illegal activity or is aware of circumstances from which the activity is apparent. And furthermore, Article 15 of the directive states this, there must not be a general obligation on providers to monitor the information or a general obligation to seek facts indicating illegal activity. So, is Airbnb a hosting provider? You can find in recitals that the exemptions of liability are limited to cases of mere technical, automatic and passive process, what is often paraphrased as neutral interme intermediary. The intermediary has neither knowledge of nor control over the information which is transmitted or stored. In the case law of the CJEU, two judgments are crucial for the court's understanding of this provision. In Google France, in the year 2010, concerning the service of Google Ads, the CJEU pointed out that the fact that the referencing service is subject to payment, that Google sets the payment terms, and also that it provides general information to its clients to support them to be better, cannot have the effect of depriving Google of the exemptions from liability. Whereas, in the L'Oreal judgment of 2011 concerning the service of eBay, the CJU concluded that in cases the operator has provided assistance, which entails in particular optimizing the presentation of the offers for sale in question, or promoting those offers, so like a specific promotion, it must be considered not to have taken a neutral position between the customer seller concerned and the buyer, but to have played an active role of such kind as to give it knowledge of or control over the data relating the offers for sale. Then the exemptions from liability would not be applicable, are not applicable. This idea can already be extrapolated from the opinion of Advocate General Boyaris Maduro in the Google France case that sees an interdependency between Article 14, so the hosting provider privilege, and Article 15, the not imposing an, an obligation to generally monitor the service. Regarding Airbnb, I would argue that the information the platform provides for its users is mainly of general nature, nature and neutral. Airbnb provides recommendations for how, it, how to be a responsible host, but also for how to be a responsible guest and to improve their chances. But if the platform verifies its users on the other hand, which it frequently does, it gets knowledge of at least some user data. In these cases, the hosting provider privilege would definitely not be applicable. But, and this is a point that I consider to be overlooked um, often, that does not make the whole platform service exempted from the hosting provider privilege. The wording to the L'Oreal decision is unambiguous in making a point that only regarding this data the platform knows is exempted. This gets even clearer in the German language version, actually. It's therefore not the right question if Airbnb constitutes a hosting provider or not to a Debatable degree, in my opinion, it is both. As a result, European law restricts national monitoring duties and liability claims quite profoundly. If this is to be changed, it is to be on a European level. And this leads me to my last point, a brief outlook to possible future developments. At least since the European Commission recommendation of 2018 on measures to effectively tackle illegal content online, it is uh, pretty clear that there won't be a single European platform directive for regulation, but the European legislator will instead take a sector-specific, more pointillistic approach, as you can already see, for example, in the copyright directive that exempts the applicability of Article 14 to so the hosting provider privilege for certain copyright infringements, and will probably go on to do this in, in other fields as well. But um, to a certain degree, I would suggest that we have to assume that safe harbor provisions will probably partly stay in place in the European Union and we will have to deal with them as jurists. So how could additional regulation, additional forms of liability be imposed under um, the hosting provider privilege? One idea is one that I, um, amongst others, Professor Busch of the University of Osnabrück has made 
if platforms are and even just if just of necessity to be seen as market intermediaries make them regulatory intermediaries as well a point we've also heard today actually member states could for example concerning Airbnb establish a register where short-term rentals or hosts must be registered, must be listed. Then Airbnb could be obliged to monitor if the apartment or the host is registered. This would also be possible under um, Article 14 of the e-commerce directive because in a frequent uh, Glavishny case, the CJEU made clear that member states can establish specific monitoring duties as long as the provider is not required to carry out independent, non-automated assessment. This is technologically possible since Airbnb has similar technology in place in San Francisco since 2017. Ideally, this type of regulation by application programming interface could lead to various improvements for Airbnb guests by preventing damages in the first place, by making it easier to hold hosts accountable, and finally, by giving them a chance to sue Airbnb if the platform neglects to properly check the host's registration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. So uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Uh, one. Okay. So uh, while you uh, think about your uh, questions, I will uh, jump in and uh, ask you one from uh, uh, that I thought about while you were speaking. And I wonder uh, what is uh, your point of view um, about uh, changing the liability here of Airbnb and similar platforms in terms of um, how it would eventually affect um, competition and diversity. Um, if, because um, if you change the safe harbor or change their liability, um, maybe they'll come into a point where they say, okay, so if it would be liable for uh, what are hosts do or don't do, so we're going to pick our host or maybe uh, shrink the diversity or maybe use uh, only hosts that are affiliated with us and not allow what was the, um, I think, the uh, primary idea of allowing diversity and allow, allowing participation and broad participation of everyone instead it was going to go and shrink. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So actually, I think you, the hosting provider privilege in general is not a bad idea, actually. So I think there is always to have the balance between innovation and regulation. And I don't think there should be no safe harbor provisions at all. But in certain cases, I think um, on an individual perspective, you, you, <coughs> could, um, you could try to make them liable for certain infringements. I, I, I guess, yes. but. I, I personally think the better way is to regulate the rentals itself, um, re regulate the hosts, regulate the guests, also and, and regulate the hosts, ha have this kind of register, and then have, you know, have um, public law regulating, we have a tenancy code, we have uh, different uh, regulations, have the hosts be registered, and public um, control over the hosts, and then the, the platform can intermediate these regulations on the hosts. I, I think this is yeah. the simple way to do that. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think the reason that, that, that I'm pushing to, to the direction yeah. of competition and, uh, um, and, and, and diversity is because um, all the, there is, it, looking at the bigger picture, there is a discussion about generally about safe harbor and about yeah. platform, uh, they should be liable or not be liable. And I think that um, looking at, uh, at my um, um, area where I s uh, research it from the aspect of copyright law and the copyright directive and making platform more liable, then yeah. the concern is that they will, okay, so, so we're gonna uh, uh, insert um, more barriers to entry and to participate. In. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it's more, more of an economic issue. Like we're talking about the allocation of the liability, 
and you have to have it in correspondence with the allocation of words. And you know, there was an old case in Israel, a really old uh, telephone, the main cell phone company used to, company could subscribe you to SMS services for funny SMSs. I think you have to be 35 and up to remember these types of old SMSs, and you would be charged about uh, almost a dollar per SMS, and you never knew when you were subscribed or not. And it was, and, and thus the central, uh, cell service provider said it wasn't us, it's a private company. And then the Ministry of Communication said, yes, but you're making all the money out of it, and therefore you become liable. So the, the intermediary thing, I think, came a lot before Airbnb. <coughs> And the question of the allocation of wealth was very simple in pinpointing who should pay. And, and this goes to my, my answer, uh, uh, question. When you ask whether Airbnb should be liable, why, why, why stick to all definitions of service provider or, or that? Go where, to where the money is. Is Airbnb making money out of a, a allocating bad apartments? That's the question. If they are, they should be liable. If they're not, they shouldn't be liable. I think it's... I, th I think, you know, go back to the basics. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, why give, I, I think talking about technology, uh, in this case, may be over-exaggerating the problem, no? Um, I, I, I kind of agree, but actually, I, have to, I, I look at this from an Austrian law perspective, and for us, it's important if it's in line with current uh, applicable European law because uh, because of uh, uh, European law uh, has primacy of applic uh, application over national law. So, from a national law perspective, this was this was the, the this was my point actually that n EU states at the moment cannot do this because EU law, at least in my opinion, prohibits them to do this. This is uh, maybe another question if they if they should do it. And, I, and, and maybe I agree to a certain extent that there could be there could be stricter liability for for the platforms. But the point I was I was making or I, I, I aim to make is that at the moment um, European law is blocking um, European states to um, establish certain kinds of liability. This was my point actually. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon everyone. It's really fun to be here and I'm so happy to see all those familiar faces. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I have to say that I was thinking to give a pure legal talk about election interference and then I figured um, we need to um, make some kind of a, of a shift and talk a little bit about political economy, uh, which is surrounding the discussion um, about um, uh, platform liability, uh, specifically, uh, uh, I think, with the uh, uh, issue of election interference. Um, I'll start with uh, with a story of election interference, actually, or maybe with election propaganda. The discussion on political advertising on social uh, network had recently moved into a new level, um, as you can all know. When, uh, as you all uh, uh, know, when Facebook announced um, that polit politicians would be um, allowed to publish fake news and political advertisement, in Twitter counter announcement um, that they will completely ban political advertis uh, advertisement for from their uh, platform. So the internet was an uproar. It was really interesting to see um, uh, how an, uh, how intensified the um, uh, the discussion uh, uh, became. Um, even uh, uh, Facebook employees uh, published a letter opposing its policy on political ads, um, and the arguments were surrounding freedom of speech and from all all different perspectives. And op eds were uh, 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 written uh, for and against it, um, and. Everyone was w w uh, was looking at uh, the 2020 elections in uh, in the United States. Now I, I want to move to a slightly different story, and I'll explain like in a minute uh, uh, the connection. I want to I want to tell the story of Richard Barr. I don't know if you uh, uh, heard about uh, this very. Um, uh, honorable gentleman. He's the head of the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee, a Republican. Uh, I think it's important, and he has published a new report 
maybe two months ago, um, on Russian interference in the 2016 elections via social media. Um, and the report, this report for me was kind of unique because it, it, it provided um, a broad overview of the activities of the Kremlin's propaganda machine, which is uh, known as the Internet Research Ag Agency, the IRA. Uh, uh, A. And it also includes some recommendations for um, uh, countermeasures uh, towards uh, or to be implemented before uh, 2020 uh, uh, elections. But here's the thing, okay? The report specifically says, um, or explicitly uh, uh, states, that most of the, of the IRA's digital uh, influence was not achieved by buying ads on social media platforms, but rather via the creation of supposedly um, organic uh, uh, content, posts, likes, trolls, shares, Facebook, in Instagram, uh, uh, Twitter, and so on and so on. And even though the, the, the report specifically says that it was not ads who, who actually created the influence, the report goes on to suggest most of the regulation um, with relation to the transparency of the purchase of advertising. And this is not the only. The, this is not the only example. Another thing that the report specifically says um, is the fact that um, the Russian interference is not um, uh, is not targeted only on election times. A election is an opportunity. It's not the main, I would say, uh, a target. And even though most of the legislation that we see, for example, the Californian uh, uh, a new bill that forbids the, the um, um, uh, a dispension of, of uh, deep fake political videos on election times. So what is actually going on here? That's the question I want to I, I wanna, um, uh, I wanna ask. Um, how it is possible uh, that although it is clear that social media ads are not the main story in influencing e elections, they are the center of discussion and the focus of suggested solutions. So I dare to say, and th here is what I'm saying, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the point where I'm not talking about legal theory. I'm talking about political economy, okay? But I dare uh, I say that this is all a smoke uh, a screen because the real issue and the real problem is this. Even if we assume that in the 2020 elections, the domestic and foreign online campaigns will function in exactly the same way <coughs> as in, two, uh, in 2016. I, I, by that, I mean using the same technologies, the same techniques that they used then. There's still going to be a blind spot or there's still going to be a major difference. And I think the major difference is that, that social uh, networking or social media platforms position in 2020 is going to be very different than in, in, uh, in uh, 2016. Uh, 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 now let me get back to this report, this uh, uh, Intelligence Committee uh, 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 report. The, de the, the week when this report came out and a transcript was uh, published um, of a recording leaked from a closed meeting held by Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook employees, at which he responded to the Democratic candidate Elizabeth Warren's electoral platform proposals for breaking up the tech giants, and he called them an existential threat. He called Elizabeth Warren's, one of the legitimate candidates for the elections, an existential threat. So in contrast of uh, in contrast with, to, with, with 2016, I think that in 2020, Facebook itself will have its own substantial interest in the political game and in being able to influence the, the outcome. This time, it will be an active player in the presidential elections, not only because it controls a huge volume of all digital discourse by mean of its term of views, as you've mentioned here, or its ability to block users or remove content or illegal content, as you uh, described so nicely, and, and Rotem, my nice partner, described uh, 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 before that, or even not because of the targeted advertising that it's willing to sell for to whoever is uh, is willing to uh, 
uh, to buy. It is it, it, it is because it has skin in the game. Its business model is in peril. And so the company does indeed face an existential threat. Um, so I think it's very interesting to hold all those academic discussions. And I think it's very important to, to even to talk about it from um, an intelligence point of view, but the, the blind uh, uh, spot lies in the lack of reference to the fact that the last four years have seen a dramatic development in terms of calls for regulation on social media platforms, in part because of what happened in the elections of 2016, but also because of various other phenomena that you've described here, ranging from revenge porn uh, via live streamed uh, uh, attacks around the world to antitrust uh, practices. The voices in favor of regulation have become dominant. It's not a coincidence that Elizabeth Warren is talking about breaking Facebook, uh, 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 breaking Facebook apart. Um, and we're talking about privacy rules, antitrust regulation, consumer protection, hate speech, protection of democratic elections themselves, artificial intelligence and, and, and deep fake videos, and of course the responsibility of social media platforms for the content they, uh, um, uh, they publish. So the tech, companies themselves um, are also, I think, keenly aware of this, uh, of this shift. And they take defensive steps, um, and we see them. Uh, for example, self-regulation, such as the oversight board that we're going to discuss, uh, uh, that we're going to discuss uh, tomorrow. Um, they also clarify that um, they're looking for regulation because they want to know th uh, where exactly they're, uh, uh, they're standing. But why, what, what I, the, the claim I want to make here is that all of these are new developments that have occurred since the 2016 election uh, 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 campaign. So it's, it's, I think it's possible to, hi, um, it's possible to claim that the issue of regulating social media platforms in an, <coughs> is entirely unrelated to that of interference with, with elections. Um, certainly, there are justifiable concerns about Facebook as an active player in the electoral process. Uh, it may utilize its immensely powerful newsfeed algorithm to garner support for candidates of, uh, who oppose um, imposing limitation um, on it or breaking it up. Indeed, that has happened even before the elections of 2016 when Mark Zuckerberg himself hinted that Facebook could do that, but uh, 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 he strongly opposed uh, uh, this idea. We can also claim that, the, that Facebook, um, uh, or we can also argue that uh, Facebook has no need to take active steps to interfere uh, with the election because the machine that it has created um, inherently favors populists and disseminators of fake news and extremists and thus, um, um, and thus will in any way make the current president re-elected. But that's, I think, um, a different uh, issue. But the truth is, however, <coughs> that we should prepare ourselves for a reversal of what happened four years ago. If during, the, and this has to do with Israeli elections as well, but I think America is now um, the core of the issue because any major regulations and platforms is going, will have to start there. Um, so if during the 2016 election it was foreign and local powers who collided to influence the outcome and Facebook was merely the platform that made it possible, in 2020 it may well be that Facebook, um, uh, it may, it may uh, uh, well be Facebook that is the party seeking to exert influence <coughs> and the other players who act as its enablers. It would be sufficient, think about it, for Facebook to become aware that a certain foreign power, for its own reasons, is interested in supporting a particular candidate and for there to be um, colliding some, somehow um, with this, uh, with this uh, uh, player. And I think that this scenario, with all the importance of legal discussions, this scenario poses a far greater risk to American democracy 
to the world democracy in so many ways than what happened in 2016. Uh, um, uh, and, and I think that if we continue talking about ad transparency and fake news dissemination, we are missing the core of the, uh, uh, of the issue. Or maybe, Danny, you can uh, uh, correct me, maybe we're just getting ready for the last war. Um, anyone who wants to prepare for the next war will have to pursue a much longer and more difficult uh, a path. And here I want to put uh, two thoughts that, uh, that I have um, that has to do with previous uh, 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 presentations in this, uh, um, uh, in this um, uh, panel. On, on, on the constitutional level, I think that the path of rethinking this whole relationship of Facebook and American politics require grasping for what I think is a very, very hot potato. And this is the First Amendment. The philosophical idea behind the First Amendment is that the expression of falsehood is allowed and it would be um, uh, it would be countered only by means of more expression, which then will lead to finding or to exploring or to understanding um, uh, the truth. That's why the right to free speech should not be limited. This is John Stuart Mill, and this is, um, uh, I think, the philosophical foundation of American constitutional uh, understanding of, 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 spree, of, of free speech. But what are we to do if it turns out that this idea is deeply flawed in a world of algorithms that prefer and promote expressions of false statements if these promote user engagement? In a world in which any attempt to disprove false statements is, likely, is like trying to extinguish a fire with gasoline or oxygen or whatever you want it. What are we to do when a founding philosophical principle becomes a monster that turns on its creator? How we can fix the underlying problems that this can happen? Should we continue talking about the separation of public and, and, and private? I think we're missing a very important point here. And the same thing goes when we talk about constitutional theory to the right of privacy. Because if we talk as, uh, to, uh, about privacy as control, as user control of the data, and we're talking about the question of what should be collected or what should not be collected, we kind of missing the point. Because what happens to the core democratic act of election when personal data can be harvested and processed so as to create mechanism to influence public opinion. Or what I called in other writings of mine, an autonomy trap or a trap on our, uh, uh, on our uh, uh, autonomy. So I think that um, we, we need to have more, I would say, conversation, for example, between intelligence people or military uh, experts and political economy experts. We need to have more conversation between legal theory, as was presented here, and political economy, and to think about how democracy is something that had to balance uh, a different um, aspects of power should um, react to that. To, to, so to sum up the issue of interference in elections, if you were expecting me to talk about you know, political ads, and I think it tells a story of a decade in that um, it is one representation of how the information society maybe has you know, got out of control. And if decision makers, or if we as the legal, as, as the, as the legal community um, want to take back this control for us and for the democratic system, we must, uh, we must act quickly, but we should not waste time on the battle that we've already maybe fought, maybe lost at the 2016 uh, uh, elections. And as to the discussion whether we need, to, or the pros and cons of the, con of the proposals, proposals for breaking up the tech companies, well, that can wait until after the elections. Thank you.
frugal things. I'm sure we have a lot of uh, comments and ideas. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. It was yeah. really yes. interesting. And can you just like, we don't have a lot of time, but I will be very happy to hear some sample of your thought about how we need to think about the freedom of expression today. If we need to abandon, as you say, the, the meal and, and conception, so what is at stake now? How do we need to think about this issue? You well, first of all, I have to say I don't have all the answers now. I think this is something we all need to think about. First of all, I think that the dist distinction between private and public is not worth worthwhile anymore. Um, I don't think that the um, understanding and so that's the first thing. I don't want to uh, be too long. Secondly, I think we need to have a better conversation of traditional media regulation experts and social media regulation experts. For example, when, when you, Marianne, um, is giving us the example of, of copyright law, I understand because you're an IT scholar, mm -hmm. but there is, seven, there is 70 years of experience in how to moderate content. And it was possible, even at the US, at the US even con considering the fact of what the existence of um, um, uh, of the First Amendment, that the FCC was able to create, for example, the Fairness Doctrine. And it was considered constitutional for quite so many years. Um, I don't think that we need to impose um, traditional media regulation as is on, um, on social media. And, and it's not that we were so good in regulated content in the past. But I certainly think we need to um, uh, uh, to get some sense from the experience. I have the feeling that sometimes people who talk about tech regulation don't know what was going on. For example, I can I I think one example I'll give you. Um, when I um, um, uh, submitted my PhD thesis about 16 years ago, I should have told you that in so many years. Um, I wrote, a, I, I wrote about concentration of ownership in the, in the print media market. I came from, from, from traditional uh, uh, media regulation, and I devoted a whole uh, a chapter there to press councils. And the reason I mention it now is that Facebook is acting exactly as media owners um, uh, acted like 30 years ago. They said, do not regulate, we can do it ourselves, and then we can talk about the life jacket that they gave them some air in, in times of need and then they threw them in the, in the, in the corner um, uh, when it was not necessary. I mean, we have a lot to learn uh, 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 from that. So a, a private and public would be one thing. Learning from uh, traditional media regulation um, uh, would be another. Um, and also, I think the understanding that we are switching, that the competition or maybe the marketplace of idea is something that we need to rethink. And just as we think about it, and it, it will be like a new deal for speech regulation. Yeah? <coughs> so in this sense, I think that would be a good starting point. And I wonder, from the other side, the, there's the argument that the, we should work on digital literacy or public reactions and what are the thoughts so again, let me just get back to uh, traditional media regulation. It has never worked. Uh, media literacy is something with a very limited success, even in the old world. So when we say that, so I, I don't think it's not important. I think it's very important. I think it's important not only in schools. It's more important in the elderly community, which is the most vulnerable today to fake news and so on and so forth. But what I'm trying to say is this could not be a final or an only solution. And whoever claims that, I think is either naive or is trying to, um, you know, withdraw regulation or to, uh, to remove regulations. And what I'm troubled about is that, in essence, in order to do some kind of regulation, there would have to be somebody talking about what is true and what is wrong, what is false and what is right. And I think any, any Jewish mm -hmm. that thinks about an entity like this, uh, become scared because this is totalitarian in nature. And the problem we had with the 2016 elections in, in the U.S. was foreign influence. Foreign influence in and of itself is not, <coughs> it's not that something new. It's just it came in a method that they didn't expect. And 
and now you're talking about a, a commercial conglomerates using their money and influence in order to, to maintain themselves, which is another not problem, which is not new, and you might not know the method. But I'm not sure that both justify regulation of speech. You're talking about financial or interstate uh, uh, interests. Those are governed and could have been governed already. The U.S. could have theoretically bombed Russia if they wanted, and the international law of fair interfering in their elections. It has nothing to do necessarily with Facebook and free speech. I, I'm, I'm really troubled why people go inside the speech, inside the free speech, instead of just talking about the interest and going to the old basic laws. Well, that's an excellent point. Uh, but first of all, I wanna I wanna correct you, if I may. Uh, what happened in 2016, and I think this is a well agreed um, a fact now, um, is that there was some kind of a cooperation. It maybe was virtual, maybe it was physical between local forces and foreign forces. This is the collusion of the Mueller report. Okay, so I don't think we're only talking about uh, uh, foreign interference. But what I'm trying to claim here is that if we thought um, that we are going to see the same phenomena um, of 2016, which is one player, which is the foreign powers or the foreign players, and then the other one is the local campaigns, we need to consider the fact that there's going to be a third player. Not two players at a platform, but three players. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to mention is that I'm not a huge fan of content regulation. The opposite is, is right. And I think that I can testify, because I came from all the regulation, about all the deficiencies of trying to intervene. And I'm thinking about the Israeli political uh, uh, or, or current political agenda. And I'm thinking about who in the government is going to, res to be responsible to, to, to decide what is true and what is not true. And I get, I get goosebumps. Okay? But, so what I'm trying to say here is that we, we are still cannot stick to the old do not touch thing. I know this is a core of democratic of, 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 of the democratic perception. Democracy never was interested was never interested in what was true and what was false because of secondary reason. Because they said there was no institution that would be suitable to do that. On the other hand, the question is whether we should sit down and stick to that and see the house getting burned. So what I'm trying to fit, to say here, obviously the best solution would be to start with, I would say, the outer circle, the privacy regulation, things that would um, kind of forbid the dissemination of this, of this content and not the content itself. The, I think the inner circle, though, is going to be co-regulation, and that was proved even in, I would say, television regulation or me, old, old media regulation to be the best solution. That is, you know, um, for example, you the, 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 the government sets the, uh, the uh, rules, but the, the, uh, the companies themselves enforce them. We should think about it. I, I'm not saying that I have a specific <coughs> a solution now. I do realize that there is a problem of, uh, yeah, we need to finish, right? Yeah. Uh, that there is a, a, a specific uh, a solution now, but I don't want us to leave this panel feeling great that we were thinking, you know, inside the box. Thank you. Thank you very much.